Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Zoom presentation. I hope you're not all getting uh, too Zoomed out. My name is uh, Chuck Desorsi. I'm a Greenways director and busy gardener in our local food forest. I'm glad to see people interested in companion planting. This is the second gardening course we will be presenting via Zoom this year. As a nonprofit organization, we will use your course funds to help move our food forest forward. You will learn the basics of companion planting, simple combinations that have been proven successful, and strategies to guide your own experiments. This class will cover kin planting and crop rotation, herb and flower companions for health and productivity. Elaine Codling is your instructor for this course. She will help provide you with invaluable key to a successful garden. Elaine is a permaculture design consultant and teacher with training in both Canada and Australia. She has been gardening organically for nearly 30 years. I've been privileged to have Elaine as a consultant at the Campbell River Hospital Forest Garden, and I know you will learn a lot from what she has to say about companion planting. If you would like to find out more about other courses or participate in improving the environment of Campbell River and its area, or get more involved with greenways in general, have a look at our webpage or Facebook page for more information. If you have any questions you would like to ask Elaine, if you could put them in the chat, that would be good. We'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Okay, Elaine, over to you. Thank you, Chuck. That's great. Okay, um, thank you everybody for coming. I can't actually see you all or um, at all. So um, if you do want to ask a question that we can try to pause. Um, during the presentation a couple of times and see if there's any questions, but if you type them into the chat, we'll be sure to get them. And hopefully we'll have some time at the end to just chat and I'll turn off my screen share and we can chat. So I'm not going to reintroduce myself because that was really um, a lovely introduction Chuck gave me, um, but uh, we'll jump right in to talking about what, what our class tonight is our we're talking about companion planting but I just want to give a little background of our framework which is we're organic kitchen gardening we are working with nature not against it we are trying to feed ourselves so we're trying to get as much year-round gardening as we possibly can continuous harvest and it's food it's veggies herbs fruit whatever the, the goal is to feed ourselves that's our basic framework um, this, I, I just changed this slide from our limits to our limits, our assets, because it occurred to me that all of these things are both, right? The climate that we have is one of the things that makes it possible for us to grow three seasons or even year round. Um, your own site, your, your sun, the slope, the wind and water on your site, those are assets as well as limitations. In this class, we're particularly going to be talking about our limitations on crops and what our crops need and trying to provide as much of that need by using other plants um, as companions to offer some of the things that they need. And then of course, our, our own time, energy and resources is always a, a limit to anything we can do in the garden. So um, our goals, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of giving you this to sort of place where is companion planting in this. You know, we have a number of goals. We want healthy soil. We want to plant in the right spot. We want to make sure there's a good supply of water to the root zone. We want to protect our crops from extreme weather. We want to reduce competition from weeds. We want to limit uh, damage from pests and disease. We want to choose the best time to harvest and we want to store the harvest at, at, adequately. So. You know, there's a number of goals and it's clear that, you know, some of them companion planting has no impact at all. And some of, some, some of them companion planting can really help us. So what we come to is that companion planting is a technique for achieving our goals. It's one of the many things that can contribute to actually having a good, productive, healthy garden with lots of vegetables available to eat and to share and all those things. It's not going to... Um, make up for other things like you can't you know the lack of attention or lack of water I mean those are things that com companion planting can't really 
um, help. It can reduce our need for water. It can reduce the, the need for interventions, but you know, a garden, a gardener has to do a lot of different things and compliant planting is just one way of trying to make the system work as well as it can. So um, obviously the awareness of plant combinations go back to ancient times. I'm pretty sure, you know, hunter gatherers knew a lot about plants before they started horticulture and agriculture. It's a common practice in China and other parts of Asia. It was widely used in pre-industrial Europe and continued to be used apparently in France. Um, and of course, widely used by the indigenous people of North, Central and South America. And in fact, one of the classic three sisters, the corn polyculture is from Central and um, Central America and actually North and South America is pre was pretty widespread because um, you know the people were gardening without plows and without fences, pretty much gardening out in the open. Um, so, it, and it's also, you know, well-deserved reputation for being the sort of the pinnacle of companion planting because every plant in the combination actually does at least two things. So your corn and your beans provide shade for the squash. Your squash and your beans reduce rodent predation on the corn. Um, apparently the prickly uh, squash and then the, the beans um, that are winding around the corn provide you know really shaky footholds, right? So it, it reduces um, that predation. It doesn't eliminate it. Corn provides structure for the beans. The beans fix nitrogen because all of these are heavy feeders. The squash and corn both are large plants with you know big, big um, ears in, of corn and big squashes. So you know the soil depletion. Apparently, back when fish were plentiful, one of the things that the native people in uh, North America did was they put a fish in every hill as, as well. So, and then the squash shades the soil and reduces the weeds and the evaporation. So it reduces the need for water, but doesn't eliminate it. There's actually, I have read in um, a couple of places, there's a fourth sister called Cleome, which is great, huge, tall flower for attracting pollinators. But that one seems to be mostly have, forgot, mostly have been forgotten. So, um, you know, well-deserved reputation for being the classic companion planting combination. And, and part of the reason, you know, that we in the West have sort of uh, forgotten about companion planting is, is that it doesn't really fit that well with Western culture, you know, mechanization. I mean, that's mechanization started in the 1700s. There's a horse-drawn plows and horse-drawn cultivators. Um, pretty much encourage row crops and, and monoculture. Um, and then, you know, gardens always, gardeners always imitate farmers in creating those long straight, you know, single, single crop rows. Um, there was, you know, a, a, a renewed interest in companion planting when ecology uh, became a science in the 50s um, and the interest in plant, plant interactions increased, but, Companion planting doesn't really fit, fit well with Western science. You know, Western science, we like to control all of the variables and just test one thing at a time. And a lot of companion planting information is observation and it's uh, intuition. I mean, with a garden, you can't control all the variables. So you never know, okay, those plants did well together, but was it because we had a particularly good climate for those plants this year? Or was it because, you know, they got everything they needed is the new soil or whatever, you know, but so it's really hard to control all the variables and go, yes, this is what works, right? So actual science, actual, you know, research into companion planting has been pretty thin. And there is a ton of information, nevertheless, on the internet. So you can find charts like this and you can look up things. There's a number of um, places I could have made two or three pages of companion planting resources and you will get the copy of this. So you can um, follow these ones up or you can find your own. There's so many, so much information out there that um, it's overwhelming. And the problem is, is that it, it's not necessarily consistent. Some of the information is contradictory, um, you know, because it's all based on individual observations and sort of this um, 
more empirical approach rather than an actual reductionist science approach. It's hard to say this does this, right? It's, it's not definitive. It's more of a of the kind of thing where you have a starting point from the information on various websites or charts like this one, and you try things. You, you check it out on your own and you keep you know trying things in the garden and then you go back to the, the websites or the books or whatever and you read more and then you try more and, and you gradually figure out some that work for you or you find you know the tried and true ones and you use those. Um, one of the things that I will just say about the three sisters is the corn that they were growing is what they call flint corn. It's a, it's a grain, it's one that they ground up for flour. It's a much heavier plant. So if you're gonna try a corn beans and squash combination and use sweet corn, uh, the corn is not actually strong enough to provide support for the, for the beans. You really do need to put extra support in there because we're, it's a different kind of corn. Anyway, back to, companion planting, figuring out which are good plant compa companions. So um, good combinations decrease your workload, they improve your yield, and they actually speed up the soil building and improve the fertility of the soils. Um, they can deter or trap pests. They can attract beneficial insects and pollinators. They generally will reduce the need for water if you're doing cover crops or you're planting between the rows. Um, they add fertility, they improve soil health, and, and generally increase overall yield um, of the space, which, you know, you, if you think about it, if you're growing just lettuce, you're going to get a lot more lettuce than if you're growing lettuce and three other crops. But overall, you're going to get more food off that space than if you just grew, grew one thing. So the overall yield, not simply the amount of lettuce, but the amount of lettuce and everything else you're growing in that spot. Um, pest control, um, that's a really popular uh, companion plant, the whole roses love garlic. Um, roses love garlic because garlic um, deters uh, pests and reduces, um, what is it, black spot on roses? It, so garlics are a great, garlic's a great companion for, for roses. Garlic's a great companion for a lot of things. It comes up in our superstars uh, a little later in this presentation. But for pest control, companion plants can repel insects, they can trap insects, they can actually attract the predator insects. Um, so trap crops are a thing where you actually let the pests go at it. For example, for aphids, you might you know, just let the aphids have one plant and that will attract the predator insects that wanna eat the aphids and you'll have less aphids elsewhere in the garden. Um, you can attract beneficial insects. So you're providing food or for predator insects at other stages of their life cycle, or you're providing habitat for them to overwinter. Um, you're actually, you know, um, hosting the, the pests that predator insects feed on. If you're planting sacrificial trap crops, you're, you might plant something like I had at Lake Trail one time. I had, um, a uh, kale that was just covered with aphids. It was just covered with aphids. And I noticed that none of the other kale plants were affected at all. And so I left it there and people would come and go, oh, you got to get rid of that. And I'm like, really? I don't think so. It's, you know, I'm not going to get any kale off that one, but look at the plant right next to it. It's absolutely free of aphids, right? So I sacrificed one of my kale plants so that the rest of them would be pest free. So for example, flea beetles, the flea beetles are the ones that um, uh, do, I don't know, can you, can you see my cursor, but see those little holes and they actually love mizuna or totsoi and they love radish. They love, um, they love those better than they love anything else. So you can actually, if you wanna grow radish or totsoi, you might actually have to use insect netting, but you can also, grow them as a sacrificial crop uh, between the rows of something else that you want uh, so that the flea beetle devours that instead of your preferred crop. Um, potato beetles apparently prefer eggplant. Um, nasturtiums, another one of our superstars, is an aphid attractor. And aphids apparently are plant specific, different 
types of aphids like different types of plants. So if you've got nasturtiums that are covered with aphids, the aphid predators will come. The nasturtiums uh, may be sacrificed, but the predators will eat any kind of aphids. And the aphids from your nasturtiums are not necessarily going to get onto your other food crops. So um, sometimes sacrificial crops have to be removed before the pest populations actually reach maturity. Sometimes you can wait it out and um, hope the predators come. Uh, I have, uh, you know, the experience of having aphids all over an artichoke, and I was, I was, you know, watching and watching, and I finally, you know, out of desperation, I sprayed it with a, a soap insecticidal soap and I came back just a couple hours later and there was a lady beetle going blah yuck 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 who put soap on my food and that was a lesson for me I just had to wait until that pest population got to a certain point before a predator would come so uh weather protection and um I can't actually even see my slide here um preserving the water, reducing the, the water requirements. So taller plants uh, providing windbreaks or shade. Uh, one of the things I like to do is the early season, cool season crops, if I want to plant them in the summertime, for example, peas and lettuce and things like that, that actually prefer cool, plant them in the shade of taller plants like tomatoes or corn. Um, cover crops or uh, crops planted in between to shade the soil, like the squash in the corn beans and squash shades the soil, reduces the evaporation, so you are less dependent on uh, adding water. Um, you can do the same thing with mulch, but cover crops actually feed the soil as well. And if you're interplanting other crops, then you're du duplicating and getting more productivity out of the space. Adding fertility, particularly the, the legumes, the beans and clover and peas. Uh, clovers are very popular as a cover crop between crops. Um, they actually take the atmospheric nitrogen and fix it, turn it into soil uh, nitrogen and release it into the soil when they die. But they also make more nitrogen than they actually need to share around. So it's not just when you cut them down, but just growing those plants um, either in a rotation or in between other things can actually improve the available nitrogen to your other, your other plants. Dynamic accumulators are an interesting one because any plant with a long tap root um, will actually draw minerals up from the subsoil and release them to the surface where the other plants could have them. So if you think about something like dandelion or mullein or uh, dock, yellow dock or burdock or any of those, you know, with the long, long tap root, um, those kinds of weeds are very hard to get rid of. Like you can dig and dig and dig and not actually, you know, successfully, even if you've got four feet, that's a five foot or six foot root, right? So they'll come back. And, and one of the things you can do is just chop them off, uh, use that leaf matter for mulch. It's high nutrient mulch and, and eventually you will exhaust the root. Or if you don't exhaust the root, you'll have an endless source of mulch. So that's good too. Um, in, increasing the yield, that's one of the main um, motivations for doing companion planting. You, you can intercrop and have two or three crops in one bed. And as I said earlier, you're not going to get as much of you know, what you would have got if you'd had a monocrop, but you're going to get more overall. You're going to get more food in total. You can also do a succession planning. So you can actually do two or three crops in one plot um, over the course of the year. And you can underplant or use um, the spaces between plants as in-ground seed beds. So you can speed the transition between cool season, warm season, and cold season crops. And you can actually plant underneath something that's almost ready to harvest. And as long as you don't have to dig it up to harvest, as long as you're not going to disturb the roots of your new crop, you know, cut it off at ground level um, and harvest it, then you are making, you make the room for the next crop to come up and you've got it planted like three or four weeks sooner than you could have if you'd waited to till the other crop was gone. Um, so, I, I guess I should just check in with you, Lydia. Are there any questions in the chat that we should be answering? Hi, everybody. Um, yes, there's actually one question that just came in from Lorraine, and she's asking if the aphids are, uh, she, so she says, uh, 
is responsible for if it's the wet moth. Oh, yep. I'm sorry. I... So she said if it's the white moth uh, no. that it's responsible. No, the white moth, that's cabbage butterfly, I think is what she's talking about. Aphids are a different kind of a pest. Cabbage butterfly is a, as a, it's a harder one to control, um, but there are predator insects that do, um, do eat the egg masses of the cabbage butterfly too. So uh, I think I even have a couple of slides on that. So we will talk a little bit more about what individual combinations do and, and um, that cabbage butterfly bit comes up. Aphids are an interesting one because apparently the aphids that will attack your nasturtiums are not the same aphids that will attack your other plants. Like they, are, they tend to be plant specific. Um, if you ever get a chance to listen to, Arzina Hamir has a really good uh, pest, uh, organic pest control presentation that she does. If you see that, that's, um, it's a really well worth tuning into because she's an organic market gardener here in the Comox Valley. And she's done a lot of um, work with um, the university research and the Ag Canada research on pest management, organic pest management. So... Um, there's also a really good book on uh, pests uh, and diseases by Linda Gilkison, who's my garden hero, um, and she's actually an entomologist. So her stuff on insects and and uh, insect predators, you know, pests on your plants is really really good. And she has a uh, website and a blog that she a newsletter that she sends out. So that's a, another really good one to check in for pest stuff. But um, let's carry on and talk about uh, what makes a good combination. So what you really want to do, because, you know, you can just look up carrots, you know, what do carrots combine well with? You can look it up online. You don't need me to tell you that. But if you're trying to think about combinations, you, you need to know what you're trying to achieve. You know, what, what do do carrots love about tomatoes you know and, and what else do they love you know what is the what is it that carrots need from a companion plant what is it you're trying to achieve from that so it turns out that it's the carrot rust fly that we're trying to it's a predator passed on carrots and it um the the larva eat at the carrots underground and you get these little kind of uh, discolored patches that look like rust right the adult rust fly locates the carrots by smell and, and tomatoes mask the scent. The tomatoes have their own order. It masks the scent of carrots, right? So when you look up carrots, you'll find that strong aromatic herbs are, you know, that mask their scent are recommended for carrots, okay? So, you know, where thought process is uh, going on, we're going to think about something like dill, for example. And, you know, dill is a strong scented herb, but carrots actually dislike dill. So why is that? Carrots and dill are the same family. They are similar kinds of plants. They both have the long tap root. They complete, compete for nutrients. They both attract the carrot rust fly. Uh oh, um, And it turns out that dill doesn't actually like any of the carrot family, with the possible exception of celery. So, you know, dill is a strong aromatic herb. Uh, dill and carrots are a family. You'd think that, you know, you plant them in the same bed and they need the same water requirements, all those things. It, it turns out, no, this doesn't work. So there we go. Is dill a friend or a foe? Um, and interestingly, there's very strong plant chemistry in dill that repels many press insects when it's in the vegetative state. That, mean when, that means when it's leafing. But when it starts flowering, it actually can have a negative effect on those very plants that, you know, it's protected from predators while it was in the leaf phase. It's now going to have a negative impact on those plants. So if you're going to use dill to repel pests, you need to harvest it as dill weed and, and have the dill weed as, you know, but if you want flower heads, like if you're going to make dill pickles and you want flower heads, you can't be growing dill uh, near most things. Dill is pretty much doesn't like anything and it, it has a detrimental effect when it's flowering on all kinds of things. Uh, the, the flowers, um, you know, all of the flowers in the carrot family attract all kinds of pollinators and predatory insects, right? But for some reason, 
and you know this goes back to okay we see this happening but we don't necessarily know why because there's too many variables and there hasn't been research for some reason dill is not good for other kinds of plants when it's when it's maturing so you know it's it's a tricky one how do you use that you have to pull it out once before it flowers or you have to grow it somewhere separate and not have the benefit of it, of it um, as a pest repellent. So it turns out that dill is actually okay with the brassicas, so all the cabbage family, um, asparagus, corn, cucumber, lettuce, and basil, but doesn't like the carrot family and doesn't like the tomato family. So carrots may love tomatoes, but dill does not love tomatoes or eggplant or potatoes or peppers. Um, an antagonist is basically something that is gonna have a detrimental effect. It's either competing for root space or nutrients or light, or it attracts the same pests or it reduces, somehow reduces disease resistant. You know, garlic, for example, is a really good one for a lot of um, plants because it increases disease resistance. Um, an antagonist is something that's going to inhibit the growth and vitality. And, and again, we don't necessarily know why, and we may not know the mechanism for why it's an antagonist. So a few combinations that work and a few that don't. Um, the hot season plants, um, the heat lovers, uh, tomatoes and peppers go well with basil, cilantro, carrots, and lettuce. And that's an interesting one because lettuce isn't a hot season plant. Lettuce is a cool season plant, but growing in the shade of either peppers or tomatoes it sort of works, especially on a hot summer. Your lettuces are going to need a bit of shade. Onions, chives, and parsley go well uh, with tomatoes or peppers. And then your true marigold and nasturtiums also go well with your with your tomatoes and peppers. Um, I don't know if you could do a bed with all of these things in it. I think that might be a bit much, um, but, um, and certainly I've found that uh, peppers, um, I separate my peppers and basil from the tomatoes because what I've found is that the peppers and basil seem to grow well together, but the, the tomatoes sort of overwhelm the peppers and the, and the basil and, and they don't get enough light or something. You know, it's, it's, it just, it sounds like it would work well, but it doesn't. Okay, so tomatoes don't like or are antagonistic to the cabbage family, to corn, to dill, to fennel and potatoes. And the potato thing is because um, the uh, tomato blight um, and potato blight are the same and it, it has a negative impact on your, um, the blight will build up in the soil where the tomatoes are growing. And if you try to grow potatoes, in there, the potatoes won't do well. And the, the reverse is true. It's better not to grow your tomatoes in a bed that has had potatoes. Um, okay, cabbage family, this is a cool season polyculture. The brassicas, uh, and interestingly, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, and kale are all the same plant. I just found this out a few months ago, but it's like dogs. There's a, a million different varieties of dogs, but they're all dogs. So the brassicas, um, it's basically the same plant with different varieties. They like dill, they like celery, they like chamomile, sage, rosemary. And I think the, the, um, the aromatic herbs are partly deter that cabbage butterfly. I think that's part of the reason they like it. And they also do well with onions, the onion family, chives, shallots, scallions, all of those. So that those are good combinations. Um, brassicas do not do well with the nightshades. So no, no uh, cabbage and peppers together. They don't do well with uh, peas and beans or corn and squash. And they don't do well with strawberries, which I don't know why. You know, we don't know why. So, but um, you see that corn beans and squash doesn't do well with the cabbage family. So that's a separate polyculture. Corn actually does well with potatoes. It um, any kind of squash, so pumpkin, cucumber, melons could be substituted in for your for squash. Um, and it um, peas. You could grow peas instead of the beans. Um, it does well with sunflower, and I think that that's a light competition, that sunflower, because it's tall, and corn, because it's tall, it, it doesn't shade out the sunflower. I don't actually know if there's a, a beneficial interaction other than that, 
uh, most things, you know, if they can't tolerate the shade of the corn are not going to do well. And tomatoes are an antagonist. Um, the tomato hornworm and the carrot earworm are both common names for the same pest. So they share a pest in common. So that's their, their antagonism. So beans, of course, the classic three sisters combination, um, they have a mutual pest protection with potatoes. Um, potatoes deter the Colorado, no, beans deter the Colorado potato beetle, which I don't even know if we have on, on the island and the potatoes produce, uh, uh, deter a bean beetle. So beans don't do well. It's one of the few things beans and peas don't do well with onions. They, they are antagonists to the onion family. So peas do well with carrots, turnips, radishes, cucumber, corn, beans, potatoes, aromatic herbs. Um, I think if you think about the peas and the root crops, you, you can see that the, the roots take up different zones of the soil, you know, the root zones, the carrots have a tap root, peas have a spreading root, so they're not competing for space underground. Um, and as I said, you know, your corn beans and squash could easily be corn peas and cucumber if you if you prefer. Uh, carrots, of course, we talked about carrots like onions and aromatic herbs um, because it deters the carrot rust fly. They also do well with lettuce and peas and tomatoes and dill is not their friend. Potatoes, um, they're, you know, beans, corn, eggplant. Uh, apparently eggplant is a good trap crop. You plant it at the corners of your uh, potato beds and the, the pests that uh, prefer eggplant. They don't like the potato as much as they like the eggplant. So it's a sacrificial planting. You're not going to get eggplant if you plant it that way, but you're going to get less pests on your tomatoes. Um, and horseradish is another one they say um, plant in the corners of your potato patch. That's tricky though if you're doing a crop rotation because horseradish is a perennial and it's a long-term perennial with a huge taproot that once it's planted there, it's it you can you can you know, take a piece and plant more somewhere else, but you can never get rid of it in that spot. Antagonists for potatoes, squash, pumpkin, cucumbers, tomatoes, raspberries, again, who knew? And I mean, you wouldn't want to grow raspberries uh, near anything that you were going to have to dig to harvest because you'd be disturbing the roots all the time. So, and then sunflower. And again, I don't necessarily know why you wouldn't, sunflower wouldn't do well, but it doesn't. So, um, Lettuce seems to get along with all kinds of things. There's really not much in the way of um, antagonists. Um, whoops, sorry, go back. Um, they're, the brassicas, they uh, apparently inhibit the germination because I have grown lettuce and brassicas together when I, when I plant them as plants. Uh, there's never any problem. And in fact, I was surprised to find when I seeded lettuce around my brassicas that I got almost no germination whatsoever. And then I looked it up and went, hmm, that's really odd. So if you're getting transplants, if you're getting those little six packs of lettuce, you can plant them in between your brassicas. And I like to do that because the, the you know, the cabbage and, and broccoli are, are, they're huge plants. They take up a lot of space, but they don't take it up right away. So you want to give them a lot of space. And if you can plant something in between to, you know, use the space while they're small, and then as it, it's got to be something that you can harvest and get out of there soon, like a short, a short season crop. Um, so then the brassicas can take up the space. So I, I, I don't know, maybe spinach would work. Spinach is a cool season crop. I have to try that. And okay, so that is still fennel. Fennel again is a um, carrot family. And apparently fennel doesn't like anything, really, like really doesn't like anything. So that's, that's interesting. Okay, um, questions at all? Okay, I'll just carry on. Um, I'm sorry, that just took, took a second there. Um, I, so Elaine, there is a second question from Lorraine. Uh, she that was regarding an earlier topic. She's asking, should the garlic be planted in the ground or can it be hung in the trees or rose bushes? Oh, 
Um, well, we're talking about companion planting, so it just never occurred to me to use it that way. Although, interestingly, I do take the um, the tops from my onions and from my garlic, and I spread it around in my mulch in various places that, you know, to, like, so when I harvest garlic in July, I will take those tops and actually um, use that as mulch in other areas where I want to deter pests. So um, yeah, I had never, it never occurred to me that you could hang it in in your plants. Um, I'd be fascinated to find out how that works. If you try it, let us know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, could be, could be a new thing and, or maybe it's an old thing that I've just never heard of. So yeah, give it a go. Okay, thanks Elaine. <laughs> Okay. It with questions so far. Okay. So um, companion planting superstars, I just thought I'd go through these uh, few that are just absolutely wonderful for all kinds of things and um, uh, talk a little bit about them. And then we'll get into uh, a little bit of um, crop rotation and, and the complications of companion planting. So um, nasturtiums are amazing. They are really good cover, ground cover, so they reduce evaporation, like they will just spread and cover the ground. They reduce evaporation and they also provide habitat for spiders and ground beetles. Ground beetles eat um, slugs, so you want habitat for those ground beetles. They're a really good trap crop for aphids, so the aphids will get onto the nasturtiums and the aphid predators will come before the aphids get onto your food crops. They deter a lot of different beetle crop pests and they deter white fly, which is uh, not the same as uh, cabbage butterfly. White fly is a different um, pest. And I unfortunately don't have a picture of it. Uh, nasturtiums also attract pollinators and the flowers are lovely. They're they're kind of sweet and spicy and in a green salad, like if you're, you know, if you're picking a variety of greens and you put the whole nasturtium flowers in the salad, they're absolutely delicious. They give it a little bit of a, just a little bit of a zing. Um, and of course they're beautiful too in the salad. Um, true marigolds, French marigolds. And I make the distinction because calendula is also sometimes called marigold, but calendula is the daisy-like one. Um, um, and uh, marigolds actually are fabulous for repelling crop pests, and they also repel uh, soil-based pests like nematodes. So marigolds are a really good one. They aren't so much of a spreader. They're the kind of thing that you can plant marigolds in the corners of your beds, and they, they really help a lot of things. Um, and they're beautiful, of course. Um, Elysium. Elysium is a really interesting one because it's so good at um, uh, providing habitat for predator insects that even commercial growers, commercial lettuce growers will grow Elysium between the rows because it actually helps get them a clean lettuce. You know, you grow lettuce in your garden and if it's a little chewed around the edges, okay, you're gonna pick that part off and eat the lettuce, but nobody wants to buy lettuce like that, so. It also, because it's got that low habitat where it covers ground, it suppresses weeds and conserves moisture. It attracts pollinators, particularly green lacewings, which are fabulous aphid eaters. So Elysium is a really fabulous one. You often see it growing uh, between the rows. So there'll be like a row of lettuce and a row of Elysium and a row of something else and a row of Elysium. Um, aromatic herbs. Um, Generally, the role of aromatic herbs is to confuse the plant pests that identify their, their plant hosts by smell. Um, they may also exude chemical pest inhibitors, but that's not necessarily known. There are plants that um, we know, you know, you can, you can make them into pest sprays like tobacco. You can, you can mash it up and, and uh, make a tobacco sort of tea and spray it on plants for pest management and, and things like that. But um, it's also possible that aromatic herbs have a chemical exudate in soil or through the air that inhibits, um, inhibits pests. I think, um, what was the other one? I think dill is like that. I think dill actually has some kind of a chemical exudate, but again, we don't know. 
Uh, garlic, garlic and the other alliums. Um, garlic, of course, is the strongest, right? So it has the strongest uh, effect because it's the strongest, you know, garlic taste or onion taste. Um, it It is actually uh, really good for repelling a number of different crop pests. Um, and it combines well with almost any other vegetables except peas and beans. So that's definitely a superstar. Um, I like to mix the onions, um, shallots, and uh, scallions, and you know all my annual um, uh, uh, onion family plants. I like to mix them in with like lettuces in between the rows, or you know any of my uh, salad greens in between the rows because they they grow they grow and have less pest damage, less of, less of the little bugs eating my food before I get to it. Okay, so now we've got the problem with alliums, right? So they, the problem with uh, garlic is, even though it's recommended as a companion to a lot of different vegetables, the onion family as a whole, the whole family, is susceptible, particularly in um, the West Coast here, where we have uh, quite damp soils and often stagnating soils, you know, where the water is is not necessarily got the best drainage or whatever. Uh, white rot, and this is a soil disease that can persist for more than 30 years, 30 years. So if you get white rot in your bed, that means 30 years you can't plant onions in that bed. That's a big disincentive to use um, garlic as a companion planting to all your veg as a companion plant to all your vegetables, right? Um, brassicas, the a cabbage family is another one that has a soil disease called cabbage club root. Um, and again, you can you can end up with a soil disease that means you cannot plant successfully plant brassicas for 25 to 30 years. So for those crops, you've actually got to do a crop rotation. You, if you if you can, you do a four year crop rotation. If you can't, you do three years or two years or whatever you can do. So crop rotation is another technique. We've been talking about companion planting as a technique for achieving some of our gardening goals. Crop rotation is another technique for achieving some of the same goals, but it's a different technique. And they, when you get the intersection between you know, these soil diseases, which uh, you have to think about when you're companion planting. So crop rotation can also be used to improve fertility and reduce nutrient depletion. Um, one of the things about growing the same crop on the same soil year after year is that the, the nutrients that crop wants are going to be depleted. I mean, when you're gardening, it's usually a small enough space that you can just add compost, add fertility and, and build up the soil again. But if you're doing it on a large plot or in a farm or on the broad acre, you absolutely have to do crop rotation for nutrient depletion. Um, the main reason we do it as gardeners is because of this risk of soil diseases, but there's also the crop pests. So, you know, carrot rust fly, if you plant carrots in the spring, um, if you plant them in the same spot as your overwintering carrots, that's not a big deal because the carrot rust fly population will be less in the spring. But if you plant your summer carrots in the same plot as you have your spring carrots, the you know, the carrot rust flies got like three generations, four generations on a long hot year. Um, by the time those carrots are, are uh, you know, there's gonna be a lot of predators, a lot of pests on those carrots if you keep planting in the same spot. So, I mean, you can use insect netting. You gotta make sure that you don't have insects already in the spot. So really, even if you're using insect netting on carrots, you want to make sure you're not planting them in the same spot, but that's one year's carrot. You could lose that crop, not 30 years. So crop rotation is very critical for a few crops, the brassicas, the alliums, and then of course the potato tomato thing. Um, you, you don't want those diseases building up in the soil. So four years, if you can do it, I mean, it's, Crop rotation for soil diseases is kind of um, the, the precautionary principle. It's like, don't run with scissors or don't cut towards yourself, right? It's like, you may never have a problem, but why set yourself up? Don't, don't set yourself up for trouble. So it's a, it's a precautionary thing. If you don't have enough room, 
to do a four-year rotation, do a three-year rotation. If you don't have enough room for a three-year rotation, do a two-year rotation, but make sure that you get any volunteers or remaining plants out of that soil as soon as you see them. And everything else is not a problem. So knowing your plant families can help. I, I won't go through this because I do want to cover some other stuff, but knowing your plant families and you'll get this slideshow, you can look at them, the, the allium, the, um, the onion family, the nightshades, the tomato family, the brassicas, the parsley family, there's the legume family, which is a good one to know. And then all of the spinach beet chard, which has that same leaf shape, like a goose foot. The daisy family is another good one to know because a lot of your, um, veggies like your salad greens are uh, daisy family and a lot of your good companions are daisy family as well um, the squash of course summer and winter squash melons gourds all of those and then the only grain we really grow is corn so that's not a big deal but you want to rotate your onions your cabbage your carrots and then the potatoes and tomatoes you know make sure you're not growing them alternately in the same bed um, Okay, I already talked about this. Your spring carrots can follow your overwintering carrots, but your summer carrots should be in a different spot. And you can mask the scent of carrots by intercropping with some kind of ar aromatic herbs. The problem there is that aromatic herbs tend to be perennial and carrots are annuals and they're gonna be moved to a different spot. You can also mulch um, just side dress with spent coffee grounds. So I collect my coffee grounds in a yogurt container until I've got a full yogurt container and I, I just side dress the carrots and you know I start where I left off three days ago or four days ago whenever I did it and I just continue doing that. That seems to help confuse the carrot rust fly. So this is kin planting. So we're planting all of the same family in the same bed. And this, you know, we run into trouble with the competition for root room, the competition for soil nutrients and all those things. But if you, if you do it right, you can do it. Your, your um, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, all in one bed with your kale and then move that bed to, you know, a different place in the, in the next year. Um, the nutrient depletion for gardeners, it's not such a big deal because you can always add compost. You can always build your soil. And if you do a four-year rotation, one of those years should be a legume crop. So you do brassicas the first year, you follow it with a root crop like potatoes. You follow that with an onion crop and then you follow that with a legume crop. And so you do the legumes just before you do the brassicas again. Brassicas are heavy feeders. The legumes add nitrogen. So that's the kin planting. And that's a really good way to do the disease control. Um, the problems, of course, are competition for nutrients and root sprays, and then the shared pests. Um, so make sure you give really good spacing and intercrop with something quick to harvest uh, crops to make sure, you know, so that you're using your space effectively. Make sure you include your legumes in your rotation and add compost. And then intercropping can also help to repel or trap pests. So that's a consideration when you're doing um, uh, kin, kin crops. Um, providing habitat for predator insects is a big one. You know, I really encourage everybody to have a little bit of a wild area in your garden. No matter how small a garden you have, you can have a little wild area over by the compost or someplace, someplace where you don't weed and you don't mow and you just let it be wild and the other thing for um overwintering predatory insects is don't do fall cleanup don't ever do fall cleanup and don't do your spring cleanup until you got consistent daytime temperatures of 10 degrees because those those uh, insect um beneficial insects you know need a place to live and survive the winter if they're going to be there doing their job for you in the spring so this is a image of a, um, a cabbage butterfly egg mass. It's tiny, it's about, that whole thing is about the head of a pin, a little glass headed pin. Um, there, you can see them, so you can see the egg mass, um, but it's, it's absolutely tiny. If you turn over the leaves of your family and if you just see them, you know, just rub it out with your finger. But um, there are, 
um, a number of predator insects that eat, particularly wasps. So a little bit of a thing on shifting up our, our behavior to reduce the conflict between wasps and people. Wasps are, oh, did they go backwards? Coexisting with wasp. Yeah, a few, a few things to just like, um, you know, if you're eating outside in the late summer, it's really the late summer when they're a problem, just don't leave food out, you know, only bring out what you're going to eat and eat it and make sure you clear the plates right away and things like that. Just, you know, try to try to not create a situation where the wasps are going to be a problem. Okay, so the, the challenge with uh, companion planting and crop rotation is that perennial plant companions don't really work that well with an annual rotation. So um, you can actually do a perennial bed, like I have um, Welsh onion, which is a perennial scallion and chives in a, a permanent bed that I can plant arugula or lettuce or whatever into that bed as part of, you know, um, an in and out different things in the bed, but the chives and the, and the, the Welsh onions stay there. I, if you plant chives in your annual beds, then you've got a problem with the, the soil disease for the onion family, right? So that doesn't work. But so I tend to have perennial, perennial beds and, and, and annual beds. So the annual rotates and the perennial beds are, you know, some things rotate in and out, but the perennial beds are where I grow things that are, you know, not going to, just so they don't mess up my crop rotation. And perennial veg veggies can be grown as ornamentals too, right? Like they're beautiful. Uh, the image at the top is called um, snowball. It's garlic chives and, and the chives are gorgeous. Um, these are the scallions. These, this, where's my cursor? Right here, the scallions at the on the right hand side. Um, you know, they, they're beautiful plants and they can go in your border, your flower border, or your ornamental beds, or you can have a or, um, perennial vegetable bed. Rhubarb is another fabulous perennial vegetable that is gorgeous. And rhubarb is an interesting one because it actually uh, shades out and sort of crowds out a lot of things. This fence, you can see, I don't know if you can see, but the, there's morning glory that invades from the neighbors. And um, the rhubarb actually, it doesn't stop it completely, but it really, really uh, weakens it and makes it um, less vigorous because it doesn't get enough light to really get going. So. Rhubarb is another really great dynamic accumulator and mulch producer because it's got that great huge tap root. It's bringing up nutrients from below. And then as you harvest it, you've got these huge leaves that you can put down to suppress weeds. Um, it, it shades the soil. I mean, when you use the, the leaves as mulch, it also shades the soil and limits evaporation. As I said, it weakens the weeds. I've, I found the section of the fence that has the rhubarb is much less prone to the grass, the buttercup, and the morning glory that want to come in from the neighbors. Uh, rhubarb is actually benefited by grass brassicas. So if you have perennial arugula, could go in your rhubarb with bed. Um, you can also, uh, you know, plant beans in in around the rhubarb or beside the rhubarb, and and do a rotation of annual crops with your um, perennial vegetables. And it turns out that strawberries and rhubarb are just as great in the garden as they are in the kitchen. So that's a good one. This is lovage. It's part of the carrot family. This plant is like five feet tall. It's beautiful. And it's got um, kind of a celery flavor. It's a little spicier, a little stronger than celery. I actually just talked to someone who has been using the hollow stems as a drinking straw. So they cut off the um, the stem in the right length and they, they use it as a drinking straw. And it occurred to me that Sweet Sicily, which is another um, carrot family, uh, has a licorice, it's a sweet, has a licorice taste would be an, a good one to use for sweet drinks because I mean, you could, you could see um, lovage as celery with a tomato juice or something like that, but it might not necessarily go that well with orange juice or apple juice. But yeah, and these flowers, these umbels that, that the carrot family produce are absolutely a favorite 
for beneficial insects. They love those kind of flowers. And these are huge. They're, you know, there's a five foot plant and then another foot and a half, the flower comes out, it's fabulous. Um, okay, and it is a trapworm for tomato hornworm, hornworm which is a, also a uh, carrot, no, corn earworm, the same, different different um, common name for the same pest. So the lovage, probably good for tomatoes and for corn, and it's tall enough that it's not gonna be um, shaded out by them, but it's a perennial and they are annuals. So you plant the lovage and then plant your, your annuals with it or you know change it up there, but choose where you want your lovage to go first. This is... Um, perennial polycultures from um, permaculture. And I, I don't think we really have time to talk about it. Permaculture is really keen on perennials, uh, companion planting systems because of all the wonderful things that they do for plants. And when you're doing perennial beds um, with shrubs or fruit trees or something like that, you can actually create a, um, a system that that provides your fruit tree with a lot of different things. So fruit tree grilled is a, is a, um, it's a permaculture practice, but I don't think we really have time to go into it. It depends on whether there's lots of questions and you want to talk or not. We've got about half an hour left. Uh, I can just go through it quickly, or we can um, spend more time on it if there aren't so many questions. So this is your little fruit tree. And then this is a permaculture kind of exercise that we do. We think about what does that tree need? What does it produce? And what, you know, what are the characteristics of that tree so that we figure out where we want to put it so that we can take advantage of all these things, right? But because we're talking about companion planting, we're looking at the, what the tree needs. We're actually going to create a little... Um, polyculture to try and give this tree as much of as what it needs to reduce our own work because whenever there's something that your tree needs that it isn't getting you've got to work harder for it right so your tree guild are communities of support to maintain soil moisture to increase fertility to provide habitat to reduce your workload to reduce the need for care and attention and you, you choose these uh, varieties of plants that will do all of these things. This is a little diagram from above where they've actually, you know, planted, uh, you know, there's artichoke or mullen or, or something big and leafy that you can chop down to make mulch. There's some, some clover or beans or peas that are growing in there to produce nitrogen. There's, you know, things that will, um, um, trap uh, pests or attract pollinators or whatever. Anyway, it's you can go way into depth with a fruit tree guild, but um, the the main thing when you're thinking about your companion planting, you're you're thinking about your water requirements. Um, you know, you don't want to plant beans which are relatively drought tolerant with something that has high demands for water. Um, your root zone competition, which we did touch on earlier, right? So if you, for example, we had at Lake Trail, we had artichokes and not artichokes, asparagus, which has a big spreading root and strawberries, which have a spreading root, or we had blueberries, which has a shallow spreading root and strawberries, which have a shallow spreading root. Well, that didn't work because there was root zone competition. We actually found that with the asparagus, um, Parsley was a really good uh, ground cover for asparagus because, you know, once you seed the parsley, the roots go down and you only ever trim the top. You don't ever have to dig them out. You don't ever disturb the asparagus roots. Um, and with the, um, with the blueberries, we just, you know, they just never did well with the strawberries underneath. So we actually, um, I think what we did was we, we planted wildflowers and we found that particularly the wildflowers that have deeper roots, you know, tap root rather than a spreading root, it well with those. Um, so 
root zone competition, uh, no dig or no till planting and harvesting. If you're going to do succession crops where you plant an undercrop, you know, you don't want to be digging out your previous crop and disturbing the roots of that. Um, and then the other thing is overcrowding. You really have to be careful about your overcrowding. So place your plants according to their water requirements. You can do dense planting. You can do cover crops between the rows to reduce evaporation, but you, it doesn't mean that you cannot water. You still have to water. You, you chop and drop your cover crops to increase the organic matter. Or if you do a cover crop and then you, you know, it's taken hold and you want to plant into it, you chop that back. Um, keep your soil covered. You know, nature has a no bare earth policy. Whenever there's bare earth, the weeds come up and cover it. You know, that's why, you know, it's a bare earth is an invitation to weeds. So to maximize your productivity, you can do dense plantings, you can do succession planting. Um, so you plant like three crops in the growing season. You can do interplanting or underplanting. And um, you, you want to keep your crop rotation in mind when you're succession planting. So it's not just a matter of um, we can plant carrots in this one spot this year and we'll plant them somewhere else yet next year. If you're doing three crops of carrots, you want to have them in different beds, right? Um, you, you want to keep your soil diseases in mind, your pests. You want to make sure you are, are planning to plant for fertility. So include a rotation of legumes or something or uh, clover as a cover crop. There's a number of really good clovers. I love red clover. It's, it's gorgeous and it's a lovely tea. There's another one called crimson clover that really is like really red. Red clover is sort of purple, but um, you know, any of those, the Dutch white clover will do any of those. Um, yeah. So Maximizing your space, you might find that instead of a, a cover crop, you just want to uh, interplant with other other food crops. So you know, have your continuous harvest. Um, plant small batches. You know, I, I have a number of times made the mistake of having you know six or eight romains ready to go this week, <laughs> and then nothing for you know a month. So if you plant three three romains you know, every two weeks, it's going to be easier. Um, pay attention to your harvest dates when you, your seed packets will always have a days to harvest. If you have a, the next crop ready to go in, you can either plant it, you know, in between or underneath, or you can, you know, plant it in a seed bed somewhere and have it ready to go as soon as the, the new crop, the old crop, old crop is harvested. Um, I love doing the in-ground nursery. So whenever I harvest, so I've harvested the cabbage, I got a little in-ground nursery to grow something else. Obviously not lettuce. I, I learned that one just this past year. But, you know, anywhere where there's a space, there's a potential for putting in a few more things to grow. And then harvest all the mature uh, plants when the new, new crop needs the room. So underplanting basically is seeding that crop three, two, three weeks before the the crop, the old crop is coming out. Um, make sure you're cutting rather than, I mean, you're not going to under plant in something that has to be dug to be harvested. Um, your fall greens, uh, you can get them going under your taller hot season crops. Uh, a lot of your fall greens need to be planted in July or August, and it's really, really hot for those little sprouts. So um, if you plant them behind or in the shade of something else, it will make a big difference. And then just fill in those gaps as you harvest, have something else ready to sneak in. Um, so interplanting, we talked about this when I was talking about lettuce and um, cabbage, right? Your, your longer maturing crop is you know, that's going to take a lot of space. You can leave that space bare and you have weeds or you can put a cover crop or you can grow something that's going to be quicker to harvest like a lettuce or a spinach or something like that. You can also you know, grow a lot of things vertically and train them up and then plant, interplant with shorter crops. Uh, a lot of um, crops, not just beans, but a lot of other crops have bush varieties that you know can be planted shorter crops that can be interplanted with um, taller crops that have been trained up. 
This is my image of my kohlrabi. See how the lettuce is taking up all the space and the kohlrabi is sort of leaned forward and then whack, down it comes. I leave all of the biomass that is um, not edible there on top of the mulch just to feed the soil. And the kohlrabi can now get bigger and have more room. So again, you know, matching the requirements, the water requirements and not disturbing the root zone when you're planting and harvesting. Um, make sure when you're doing dense planting that they get the water and that you're adding the nutrients and remember to thin. This image is, you know, I, I, I love this image because this is a salad waiting to happen, but if someone doesn't come and pick that salad, it's going to bolt and it's not going to be good. So, and you know, when plants are crowded, they, they can bolt when they don't get enough water, they'll bolt. Um, it's, it's really one of the things that happens when you're doing dense planting. This could be just mowed down completely and it would come back or it could be thinned either way. It, you know, just something to give the, the plants uh, more room. So no dig or no till, till is the approach. You avoid disturbing the roots. Um, you know, slash your cover crop back to make room for whatever you're planting. You harvest with a knife, you cut the plant at ground level, you, you lift your root crops gently to reduce your soil disturbance and all your non-edible parts are just chopped and added to the mulch. And no empty space, which I also, I think I covered that already. You know, if you have transplants ready to go in as soon as that first crop is uh, coming out, um, the seed bed idea, I, I love that. Um, and then your short season crops between your longer standing crops and your succession planting so that something else can be planted when that main crop is almost ready to harvest. So companion planting is a great technique for achieving some of our goals as gardeners. It is an ongoing experimental thing that is going to be based on your observation. I mean, you could always look up anything on the internet. There's tons of resources out there, but nothing can take the place of paying attention and experimentation. Your own observation is going to be your best guide. It is complicated when you, especially when you um, have to consider your crop rotation and stuff like that, it can be complicated, but it's, it's a, um, it's a wonderful way to, to really get into experiencing the garden as a, you know, living thing in, in time as well as space. Anyway, that's my presentation and I'm going to stop uh, screen sharing so that I can actually maybe see some of you and uh, we can turn our microphones on and, and have questions. Hello. Hi, Elaine. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> I so, realized yeah, if, if, if somebody wants to to join us, please go ahead. I think I see. There's Lorraine. Awesome. I loved your presentation. I was wondering if you could recommend some good books to Elaine as far as what might be something you could access or buy. Well, um, I I do like that. The carrot, carrots love tomatoes, roses love garlic set. That's the original. The, the thing that I find with it is that there's not a lot of information about why things work. Um, okay. There's another book on companion planting. It's a beautiful book. There's a British writer, uh, Bob Flowerdew, and he's done a whole series. And one of them is companion planting. So it's, it's, it's beautiful because it's got a lot of images, but he actually goes into quite a bit of depth on, you know, various combinations and what we, you know, so there's a, a section on pest management, there's a section on fertility, there's a section on, you know, all the different aspects. Um, that, that was a really good resource for me. Um, okay. I, do, I do tend to use the computer a lot and just look at yes, the, um, the farmer's almanac always has, sections on yeah. companion planting. Thank you. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Are you coming out with a book? Uh, no, <laughs> I'm gardening. <laughs> You're a wealth of knowledge, you could, you know. 
<laughs> you know, thank you for that. That is uh, very You're welcome. Safe. Very good. I've enjoyed your presentation very much tonight. Thank you. Okay. Any From other Black Creek? Oh, okay. So you're you're in the valley here. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Oh, oh, thank you, Lydia, for putting the Arzina's <coughs> name and Linda Gilkinson in the chat. That's really great. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. I hope Lydia. everybody could see that and access that. Yeah. Otherwise, um, <coughs> I'm happy to share it with you. If you send me an, uh, an email to info at uh, greenwaystrust.ca, then um, we can supply everybody with more resources. Mm -hmm. And there are some resources uh, attached to the presentation as well, if you oh. put that in your mm. page. Mm -hmm. So what, what are people doing? What is your your new garden adventure this year? I'm getting more into herbs because I'm renting and I don't have everything totally fenced. And I've learned over the years when I was on Salt Spring, when I was renting there, by putting a lot of stinky herbs throughout my flowers, it was mainly flowers down there, it keeps the little deer out <clears throat> for the most part. <laughs> yeah. And also using Irish Spring, of course, on uh, one inch cubes, three feet apart at deer nose level. So those two I found very helpful. My sister was suggesting something. You can put, apparently uh, deer don't want to get their feet caught in things. You can put either fishnet or chicken wire down. As long as you mm -hmm. don't let the weeds grow through, they don't like to walk. Oh. So thank I haven't heard it myself, but she said that worked really well. Oh, thank you. So fishnet or chicken wire? Or chicken wire, just like laid flat on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, I understand the theory. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I'll get back to you and let you know, and I'll be quite angry if they eat my roses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, they nibbled my they they nibbled my roses the first three years. They nibbled the branches, but the roses survived. And this year, I didn't notice a lot of damage. So I don't know whether we oh. just don't have as many deer, or whether the the plants are older and tougher, or something. They do yeah. still like to eat the blossoms. Yes, that's true. And I've been mad at them on Salt Spring. As soon as my mom brought the baby fawn along, I would just melt. <laughs> you know, and forgive her. <laughs> they're evil herbivores, but they're sure cute. Yes. The rugosa roses, though, I love all roses. So that's my forte in flowers. And mm -hmm. the rugosas with the thorny stems, they'll leave alone. Yeah, those are the ones that I planted. I thought I, they're thorny enough, I'll risk it. But they actually did yeah. grow three oh. years ago. And, and the oh, roses okay. have survived, and now they're not eating them because they're like, okay. they're like wild roses. Maybe it right? takes a bit of maturity to get those thorny thorns tough. Right. And the, um, the baby deer will eat anything. Yes, I do know that, too. Thank you. I'll, get, I'll go down and buy chicken wire at Black Creek Farm and Feed tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah. I have to a neighbor that put that out though. As soon as you said that, I remembered there's one neighbor that, and I thought, why has she got netting around her flowers? But there's bunny rabbits out this way too. And perhaps that's another deterrent. We have the wild hares. Right. And they said you have to plant marigolds to keep them out of your fence garden. Mm. Marigolds. Yeah. I There's a book called Gardening with Wildlife. It's uh, oh. the Vancouver Isle Re Island Regional Library has it. It's a really oh. interesting one because the woman was married to a forester and she was living in a national park. So she was allowed to garden, but she wasn't allowed to have a fence. And one of the things oh. she did for rabbits, and I haven't tried it, so I'm not, you know, no guarantees. Um, yeah, I don't think get that book. She did a thick border of parsley all around her vegetable garden and apparently the rabbits would come and nibble on the parsley but they wouldn't then go into the garden so oh you know my. as i said i haven't done it and rabbits don't generally read those kind of books but uh, uh -huh. yeah. oh interesting yeah i like parsley so maybe i try <laughs> thank you thank you yeah Anybody else garden adventures this year? Well, one question I have is um, I have my aromatic herbs in 
big pots, big clay pots that I over which so last year was the first year I got them so to keep them for the winter I put them in that and close to the house so when you talk about putting aromatic herbs underneath or around plants would it still work if they're in pots or do they need to be in the ground to have the root systems also I, I actually think that would be a really good idea to try it because you know we don't know exactly what the mechanism is but you know for most things like the carrot rust fly finds the carrots by smell right so having those aromatic herbs in clay pots in the carrot bed probably would work mm. it would certainly be worth trying because if that works yay that's a good thing and you can keep moving the pots around and i think i remember last year when you did um, a session you talked about uh, coffee grounds around the carrots. Yes, I do. I save up my spent coffee grounds. I um, collect them in like a yogurt container. And when I've got a full container, I just go and sprinkle, you know, just like a side dressing along the row. And I, I just keep doing that the whole summer. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's great because the coffee grounds are actually good for the soil, you know, and they, um, it would be, I think it would be problematic if you were growing in the same space year after year, you might end up with your soil too acid. But the other thing I do is when I plant my brassicas, I, I lime. So in doing that for your rotation, I'm making sure that each, each bed gets a good hit of lime at least every four years. Oh, all right. That's Thank great. you. And I, I, I couldn't figure out how to get on, so I missed the first 10 minutes. Is this, I see it's being recorded. Is it possible to view it again later? That's a question yeah. for you, Lydia. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So we're, re we're recording the session, and we will add this to our playlist on YouTube. Oh, okay. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I was writing madly, and I kept hoping there would be something <laughs> handed out. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That'll make up for no book you need. <laughs> <laughs> it's really sweet of you to encourage me. But right oh, you would love, you'd, you'd have a good book. People would buy it. <laughs> uh, I think when you run out of time gardening, right? In the winter time right. or something. In the winter, <laughs> I'll write a book. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess we're a little early, but you know, I'm happy to take questions on anything else that you're, you know, any garden questions. So, hey, Thomas. Hey, Thomas. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Elaine, is it, was it Gardening for Wildlife? Was that the book that you just mentioned? Gardening with Wildlife. I will actually. Oh, with Wildlife. It, okay. I think it is. I will find it. I have written uh, down somewhere. I've found it several times in Vancouver Island Regional Library, and I will send you the actual name with the author's name, Lydia, so that you can Lovely. share. Yeah, and all those resources I can also add to our recording on YouTube. Oh, all right. thank you. That one sounds really interesting about the wildlife, because she would have that experience when she, when she couldn't have the fence. Yeah, no, I thought her some of her ideas were really good. I mean, it's, yeah. it's it's tricky because generally you're talking about reducing, you know, the wildlife damage, not necessarily eliminating it, right? Just like mm -hmm. you know, pest control, you're reducing pest population, pest damage, whatever. It's it's very hard to eliminate. I think one of the one of the problems with the um, really damaging pesticides that are so widely um, used commercially is that people aren't going to buy pest damaged food, right? If you're if you're growing something in your own garden and there's a bit of pest damage, well, you'll just pick it off and and eat it, right? But are you going to buy mm -hmm. food like that? No, absolutely, I, I will because then I know that it hasn't had poisons all over it. I'm not finding a bug in my, my broccoli. You know, I loved it. I got lettuce from the farmer's market and I found a slug in it. And I was like, yay, my, my lettuce isn't so bad after all. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, they, the, um, uh, the organic growers and the really, you know, people who want the really clean food are a minority still, although more and more people would have it if they could afford it. But, you know, yeah, the true. commercial growers, a lot of people are still looking for, you know, the, the most affordable food. Actually, Lydia and I were just talking, and this is something I say to all of you, if there is a garden topic that you're interested in, mm -hmm. put in a request. Lydia and I were talking about doing a session on, you know, basically gardening for your food budget, you know, so that you could actually in a small space, you know, maximize your productivity of the expensive stuff and, and, and actually reduce the, the cost of your overall food budget by growing mm -hmm. what, growing the high end stuff, basically. And that would be marvelous. Where do you write to, did you say? Well, I just, just going to put that in the chat here make the request to Lydia, if, if there's a garden topic that you're interested in, I mean, there's certain ones that I'm not going to, you know, I'm not doing a session on pest control because there are people out there who are just way better at pest control than I am. Um, Arzina and Linda Gilkinson are, you know, both amazing and they both teach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's yeah. certain topics that I, I don't do because I just don't have the experience, but, you know, I've been gardening right. for, for almost 40 years now Chuck said almost 30 years but it's getting it's pushing 40 years so <laughs> it's gonna change that but so I, I do have and I have tried lots of things over the years and you know one of the things I find is that it's all new every year you're trying new stuff learning new stuff it's it's one of the things I love the most about gardening is that you're constantly learning and and having to go okay what happened there yeah true that is true elaine can you hear me yes oh okay it says craig gillis but it's jerry um i would be interested in uh, uh saving seeds i uh i did a little bit of saving of some tomato seeds last fall just to see how it would work mm -hmm. and surprisingly the seeds that I had saved out of a couple of tomatoes and stuffed into an envelope after they dried and stuck in my fridge, I, they all germinated and I had all these extra tomato plants this year. Yeah. But I'm thinking other things, I have saved some seed, my kale and a few things like that, but just how to do that well uh, and what things are best to be able to save as seed and um, I mean, I've got, they're more like weeds almost in my garden now because so much stuff, if you let it go to seed, yeah. like kale or yes. arugula. Well, then, uh, you know, when I was talking about the perennial beds, you know, that's one of the things I like to grow kale in a perennial bed because I can let it self seed and then it's in the perennial bed and it's not part of the garden rotation, but I always have lots of kale. But where are you, Jerry? Uh, Ian Campbell River. Okay, is there a seed savers in Campbell River? I don't know, actually. I just, no, no. yeah, I haven't, I haven't um, investigated that. But. Here in the Comox Valley, there's the Comox Valley Growers and Seed Savers, and they have monthly meetings, and they are amazing. They have a seed bank um, project, and they also have a, a project where, you know, if you will, they will give you seed to grow out if you will give them back seed. Right. So they will actually coach you on how to do that so that they can keep renewing their seed in the seed bank. Because you can't just take seed and put it away for years. Right. Most seed has like a three year ideal. And even in really good storage conditions, it's going to have, you know, it's going to deteriorate. Right. So they've got this program where they will actually give you seed if you will grow it out to seed and, and give it back to them. Oh, OK. Yeah, and then they they basically will sort of hold your hand to do that, you know, figure out so how would to. Would that be a session you might do though? Uh, at some um, point, that... I I would hmm, I probably try and get someone else to do that one because I do save seed, but I it's like it's an enormous topic and there's a lot of other expertise um, around that I probably would. Um, try to find someone the trouble is is not everybody who knows is willing to teach right like mm -hmm. some people are mm -hmm. 
comfortable teaching and some people aren't. So I, are, I, they, on, are they on Zoom to see David? Like our Comox Valley Horticultural Society, the Comox, uh, Comox Valley Garden Club, they are on Zoom, aren't they? Um, so what about the I, I would have to check into seed savings. And actually, that's something I will do, Lydia. I'll get that information to you so that you can share it as well. Yeah, that's lovely. Mm -hmm. I'm so, not aware, yeah. of, or I have never heard about any comparable group here in Canberra River. Chuck might know, but I don't think we have Chuck here anymore. Um, but yeah, Chuck was actually looking for seeds for the food forests that mm -hmm. he's looking after. Um, and I think if there were such a group, that would be his would have been his go to, mm -hmm. and he didn't. So I don't think we have anybody. But doesn't Camel River usually have a CD Saturday event? Yes. And who so sponsors that? Yeah. So um, we are in touch with Linda at the city, um, who's involved also in running this. Um, so I'm sure, I'm sure she could get us in touch with cedars okay um yeah yeah i i have some really good resources on seed saving and i will uh, make sure you get the information the the full name is the comox valley growers and seed savers so it's cvgss um and they have a website and contact information i'm um, certainly yeah. i've got some i mean i've got a few really good books on on seed saving and I have done seed saving on the easy stuff, you know, and I've certainly let things self seed and, you know, like the kale self seeding and I had lettuce, I had fabulous lettuce for three years because self seeded lettuce will start growing and start producing way before you can actually get in there and plant. Oh, wow. right? I'm really keen on letting things go to seed, but you know, actually saving things in little packages. I haven't done that. I, I do do the easy ones, the beans and peas I save. Um, and I often will save flower seed. I save um, sweet Sicily and, you know, calendula and, you know, um, rutabecchia, all those seeds that are really easy. Although the rutabecchia, you know, now that I know how much the birds like it, I kind of don't tend to save it anymore. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> the birds have it. Yeah. Anyway, that might not be that might not be the one one for me. If I could find someone um, with more expertise to teach that one, I would. But you know, I I would have a go if I can't find someone who's willing to teach because I think that um, you know even you know my experiments. One of the things about when you're learning and doing it is that it sort of gives other people permission to experiment and and learn too. So. Yeah. I had an interesting experience with squash. I, I, it, squash seeds are easy to save, right? But <laughs> squash will cross pollinate. I've learned. Oh, yeah. And See, so sometimes saving your own seed from your squash isn't useful because you get some weird form of some other squash. That I know and that you know the line in for me is like when they talk about you basically pollinate. You pollinate from a male flower to a female flower with a paintbrush, and then you put a rubber band around the flower and you put the flower in a bag so that nothing else can pollinate it. Yeah. And it's like, are you kidding? You want me to do what? <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> so, you know, that that level of seed saving, no, that I just, I don't, I will never get to the point of actually doing that. I mean... It's, yeah, it's great that people do it, but yeah, I'm, I'll stick to the easy stuff. Right. So, yeah, it might not be the best one for me to teach. <laughs> but we could do a, like a beginner one, right? Because I'm guessing that most of us are beginners. And then, you know, somebody else can take it to the next level. Yeah, we can. Yeah, but we just love listening idea. to you, Elaine. We want you, uh, we want those books and presentations, so... <laughs> okay well i i will you know because i can tell you the seeds saving I, a lot about seed saving and about the stuff that i won't do because it's too complicated <laughs> but that's, the that's, easy fair stuff, that's you know, understandable that's yeah. fair enough yeah. I don't even get to be really complicated. you can save yeah you can save certain seeds i know that i just have never gotten into it but i would give it a try mm -hmm. well in some things seeds Poppy seeds, I mean, that is an amazing crop. I want to grow um, the edible poppies enough 
poppy seeds to make a poppy seed cake because you, the way oh you harvest my. them is you break off this this poppy seed head and you pour it into a little bowl and that's it like that's how you harvest poppy seeds that's all the processing you have to do right so i mean that's fabulous i got poppy seeds i got uh, i think a cup it was like and i look i was all excited i looked up the recipe and it's like oh two cups i need two cups <laughs> oh, no. so i planted them <laughs> <laughs> I planted them in this year. I'm hoping I will have enough poppy seeds to make poppy seed loaf. That's awesome. Hopefully enough to plant a few extra poppies too next year. So yeah. Well, yeah. Seed, saving, seed saving could be fun. It would be. I can see that. Okay, yeah. good. it's perfect. All right. <laughs> and that would be also a nice uh, end of the season one because now we need to get away from Zoom and into the yard. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming in. And, um, you know, it's been, it's a pleasure. I really look forward to being able to see you again in person at some point, but it's great that people are still coming to, to hear me. So I appreciate it, really. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much. I really enjoyed tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Elaine, and thanks everybody for joining us despite the nice weather. <laughs> and now let's go out, get a little bit of sunshine and get gardening. Yeah. Have Thank a cup you of so coffee much. in one hand and look at the rabbits in the other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or the deer, chase them out, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Good night, Good night everybody.